we have about an hour, and we're going to keep this uh, really fluid and open and friendly and casual. Uh, those some of the subjects that are going to be, I guess, discussed or up for contention are, uh, you know, impact the real world and also the art world in significant ways. And we can go in any direction you want. I know there are art lovers in the room because you're here. I know there are artists in the room because I recognize you uh, from the work that you've done all these years, there are other creatives in the room. And so the questions can really go where you want them to go. Right, this conversation go where you want it to go. Um, I want to begin uh, uh, talking to Timotheus about his work. He's already done a tour downstairs. Many of you, I think, or some of you might not have attended that. So there might be some repetition in terms of what he's going to say. But um, with Han, the, the question of the, the process that led to the commission, I think is very interesting. Something uh, all creators might want. Uh, to reflect on because it presents a different model uh, and along with your earlier kind of no to accumulation, more to sharing a philosophy of art collection. I think that's something that struck me in, in reading about you, Han. And where the both of you uh, kind of intersect um, is the way in which this idea of sharing, of, of making public art private collections uh, impacts uh, art practice. Um, and uh, in particular in this region, now it's, you know, Indonesia, because being one of the, the hotter uh, commodities uh, on the market at this point in time. And then, of course, we can open up for general engagement and discussion. But at any time, if you have a question, if you want to make an intervention, if it's short and sweet, please put up your hand, and then we can include you into the conversation as well, right? So please don't be... Um, uh, led by me, I'm, I'm here merely as a conduit for your concerns. Okay, let's start with you, um, Timotheus, uh, about where you come from in terms of the medium. Uh, we're, we're surrounded by the work of Nirmala Dutt, it comes from a particular time in Malaysian history, reflecting on contemporary concerns, if you, if you see. I hope you all get the chance to see her work. Um, what led you to the kind of social concerns uh, the deep history of Indonesia and how you sought to uh, represent that in, in your art. Well, thanks, Sharad. Thanks, Han, for being here and for all of you of being here. <coughs> yeah, to respond to this question, uh, for me in my art making, I always put the question as my starting point. Uh, I have to admit that so. Uh, I grew up uh, with the idea of history. I'm sorry again if this uh, is a repetition of what I just said downstairs, but I think it's, it's quite important to give the base of, uh, of my um, art exploration because history came to me as something that was considered as sacred. Like there was no other way to get into the idea of the past, to see uh, our stance today, where are we now, but through the, the entry door that was delivered by the ruling power through the historical narratives. So through that singularity of history, history came to me as something that was super boring. Super boring and I was not into the history because history came as something that is pretty black and white. I need to memorize all of the dates, all of the, the names, the places, which for me, I felt unrelated at all. I felt it's, it's a way of, of my familiarity. I mean, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't felt it has something to do with me until I encounter the novel by Pramudia Anantatur and by uh, Multatuli, Max Havelar, which through the literature, uh, these authors, they, they show me the history as something that was completely blurry, non-black and white, full of in-between, uh, in-betweenness, liminality, and it's not judgmental. It's about the story of the people dealing with the tragedy of colonialism. And then at some point, it just relate. Yeah, I just feel how it resonates to, 
to the situation of history of me being taught during the new order uh, period as a student in the in the uh, school class. So through this question, then I try to to develop uh, the artwork. I imagine like okay, if the the authors can can bring such experience through the words, then as a visual artist, what kind of apparatuses that I need to build up such an experience, such an immersive uh, dimension into the audience, into the viewer, to get into this kind of experience. Then from this question and then from this uh, contemplation on the, the use of the medium and also about the narrative uh, production, then yeah, it just led me to, to the playfulness of, of working with images and also working with moving images, with film and drawings, paintings, with text, with almost anything. So it, a very playful uh, experimentation in that sense to, to really find how to create such an experience that I can have when I read uh, this uh, novel from Pramudia and Multatuli. That was the, the very first uh, contemplation of me, why I deal with so many kind of medium. So yeah, start from question and then the medium follows. And then, <clears throat> and then uh, the second part was the history as something sacred was delivered or constructed on under this umbrella of institution. So the institution plays important role in a way it creates certain level of truth, of a perception of realities that we are living on today. And this institution, they have apparatuses, let's say for, for an instance, in the academic world, we have academic papers, we have this, uh, uh, this school class and then we have also this didactic uh, curriculum, and so on and so on. So uh, this part, uh, these elements, it, uh, it is, they are standing as the, apparatus, the apparatuses to deliver this certain ideology. So I try to appropriate uh, the way this institution works through the art making. So that's why in 2012 I started to think, which then in 2013 I begin to implement it in the project called Center for Tanah Rancuk Studies that is still running up until today, which then I involve the real historian and then the filmmaker, architect, uh, researchers, writers, uh, fellow uh, artists. We try to create a fictional institution called Center for Tanah Rancuk Studies, which deal and investigate the idea of Tanah Rancuk, which Tanah Rancuk itself, it's a fiction that is being investigated in this fictional institution. And Tana Runcuk stand in this, in, this, in this context as a metaphor, let's say as an empty signifier, as, some, as, a, as a space to question everything that is unquestionable, to question everything that was put in silence, everything that is kind of taboo to, to be asked. So, by using this method of uh, storytelling and also appropriating the work of institution and the use of multiple kinds of medium in the Center for Tanah Rancuk Studies, I start to, started to question all of these things, all of this coloniality and the idea of modernity that keep being replicated uh, in the new order and in the post-new order and so on. How the logic of the colonialism keep, has a lasting impact up until today. And so it's not only about the history, but it's about the echo and the leftovers of this unfinished business that in today's world, we just taking it as something uh, normal. We take, it, we take it for granted and then without questioning it. So for me, in that sense, art stands as the way to reflect and to question all of this, what's so called the normality, those something taken for granted uh, and then to put us as a human dealing with all of these things. Yeah. So, so you give us a sense of yourself, your practice, what motivates you, 
Um, I'm not going to ask you to kind of uh, tell us more about your, your because you look very young, so I'm not quite sure what came before this. Uh, but I want to ask Han about the process that the foundation goes through that then picks up an individual, an artist like uh, Timotheus, and says, we want to give you a grant to continue your work, because clearly that is what has happened. So could, could you help us uh, through yeah. that? That is, can you hear me? As you can see, I like to be heard. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ilham Gallery for being part of our adventure, that together with other art institutions, we, and I will tell you about the process later. Or maybe you could oh. close. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to thank Ilham Gallery of being part of our adventure. I'd like to thank Timoteus also for being such a wonderful artist and being here today and explaining in such a clear way what brought you to make the work. And I'd like to thank you also for moderating this talk and I'd like to thank all of you for being here. It's so encouraging to see that there's so many people who are interested in, in the work. And um, I all, before I talk about our process, I also want to say how um, moved I am by the fact that Timoteus, a boy from the Kampong, as you said, you know, um, somehow was, was inspired to start questioning whatever was around it. I'm quite sure that uh, many of your friends, when you were six-year-old, didn't do that uh, later on. And um, you explained very well the tragedy of colonialism. And I come from the other side, obviously, the side of the colonizers. It's pure coincidence, by the way. Um, where we were told that, um, yes, of course, things weren't completely as they should have been in Indonesia. Basically, it was for the good of the Indonesians, and they were really quite stupid to throw out the Dutch because um, the Dutch brought so many good things as well. They had the railways and the post office, etc., etc. There was a complete ignorance about this tragedy of colonialism. And it's only recently that the Dutch are um, revisiting it and looking at it from another point of view. So I, I, I am so encouraged by the fact that art has brought us together. And through art, um, we're able to talk about this. I have a foundation, and our goal is to help emerging video artists. And we do that by producing new work, but just as importantly, to be sure that the work is shown in different art institutions. We have about seven grants at the moment uh, in different parts of the world, but mainly Asia. We have a grant for all of Asia. That's the loop grant where you were the person selected. We have a grant for South Asia only, a, a grant for Southeast Asia. We have a grant for West Asia that's erroneously known as the Middle East, because East for whom, right? For you, it's West. And, um, and then we have a grant that's not um, limited to uh, a region, but that has a theme which is ecology. Um, the way the artist is selected is that, first of all, we have a list of scouts. They can be curators, they can be other artists, people who are aware of what's going on in the region, and they send us their candidates. Ten scouts for each commission. Each of them send us three uh, candidates. So just imagine the sheer pleasure of receiving the dossiers of 30 different artists from Cambodia, from Pakistan, from Nepal, from Vietnam, from Sri Lanka, from countries where I would never have known artists. And then each of the dossier has about four or five different videos. So uh, my team and myself spend several days just looking at all these videos. And that in itself, I must say, is such a pleasure, you know, just to see them. And uh, we do not participate in the vote, but it's important for us to see what's going on. It's the art institutions that help to select the shortlist. And then we get together, and of course, in these last years, that has mostly been through Zoom. 
and we, the, the art institutions talk about the candidates for, that are on the short list. I myself uh, do not have an opinion. I don't have an agenda. It's not that I think I would really like this artist to win because uh, I want to learn. If I were to choose the artist, I would always choose the artist that goes with my aesthetic feeling. You know, those are the videos that you can see in my private collection. They are poetic. Um, if I were the one to choose this, would, this would just continue to be the same way. I would never be exposed to artists that I would not have chosen otherwise. So it's the art institutions also who have to who commit themselves to showing the work. Ilham Gallery committed themselves to show the work even before it was there. And I think that's very courageous, actually. You know, so you need to be an art institution with guts to participate in our project. And Ilham is that kind of an art institution. So we have these Zoom talks. Uh, we don't call them jury meetings, but of course, in the end, they are. Um, the, the artist is selected. But I think the discussion that's going on, the dialogue in itself, is so enriching for the art institutions because it doesn't happen often that they talk about, let's say, artistic content. You know, when art institutions collaborate, it's often because they're loans of artworks or there's something practical to arrange. But now, these five art institutions in this case have together come to come to a, a choice. It's, there's no compromise. They cannot choose two or three. Among themselves, they have to talk until they agree which artist they're going to show. And that process in itself is really valuable because the art institutions find out what's important for other art institutions. And these are art institutions all over the world. In this case, it's um, Denmark, it's Geneva, it's Beijing, and it's here Kuala Lumpur, and also in Taipei. So very, very diverse group of art institutions who, of course, each have their own line they follow artistically, and they have their own audience that they have to gear to. They have restrictions, obviously, in some countries that have to do with censorship. That They might have restrictions of self-censorship. Uh, what they've shown before may come into play. If it's very similar to what they've shown a couple of months earlier, that might not be so interesting for them. Um, they might be looking for something new. So all these aspects come into play, and that's what the art institutions talk about. And I'm just there to ask the right questions and to be sure that everybody gets hurt. Now, they do not often come to a conclusion right away, and this is the good thing about Zoom. We say, OK, let's think about it for a couple of weeks, talk to, talk to your curators, and let's ask the three or four artists that you think are most um, suitable for the, for the commission to talk to us on Zoom over what they would do. And um, this didn't happen in your case, but in some cases it does. So we get to see the artists, they talk a little bit about what they do, we can ask questions. These are the miracles of Zoom, of course. During the pandemic, you know, it was sort of like a, a, a second choice because it was so much nicer to meet people online, uh, in, in real life. But this has given us this option of, of, of uh, taking our time to hear the artists uh, that are selected and then it's much easier to come to a choice. I remember in your case, uh, Timotheus, I'm going to show you the kitchen, as it were, of our foundation. Um, there were several really interesting artists and um, uh, the art institutions were going for one artist for a number of reasons, particularly because they hadn't shown that artist and um, the, the, the themes were interesting and then they were about to come to a conclusion and then one person said, one director said, I'm not going to mention any names, said, hey, 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 wait a minute, but there's this Timoteus guy. He's really interesting. I had a look at it. Why don't we look at it again? And they all did. 
And then they came to the conclusion that you were the one they wanted to select. This is so interesting, you know. They already had made up their minds about one artist, and then somebody else said, yeah, but look at it. Look at the way he expresses himself. Look at how he uses the dancers, how he uses the goats, what the, 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 the narrative of... Uh, well, we looked, of course, at your previous works it was with the music that was going on. And it was so different from anything else we had seen, and it was so strong, but also unusual, particularly for a Western audience to look at. So, you know, just by talking about it, people's opinion changed. It tells you a little bit about how mind is going on. So, um, and I remember very much that when the choice was made, I had the pleasure and the honor to call you and tell you, that you were the one who received the uh, commission. You said, really? As if I would have mistaken about that, as if it were a practical joke. So that, of course, is one of the nicest things of, of, of my job, to, to be able to give the good news. And I think it was an excellent choice, quite frankly, um, because of the multi-layered aspects of, of your work and because um, of the themes, the, 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 the colonialism. So this is actually the beginning. So, you know, you get time to work on it because of COVID. The time was longer than it usually is. It's mostly a year. And then the work is shown in the different art institutions that form part of this particular commission. And Timoteus travels to all of them to talk about it, to set it up, and then to talk about um, his work. So basically, it's all about connecting people. It's connecting the art institutions, it's connecting the artists, it's connecting the public. It's, it's sort of like weaving a web around the world. So if I could just ask for a clarification, Han. Um, you are not limited geographically in terms of where the artists come from, but do you have a preference for video art? Is that, would that be true? No, it's all video, only video art. Why is that? Yes. Uh, we have until 8 o'clock this evening yes. to talk um, about okay. Consensus, uh, yeah, you can stay till 8. Okay, fine, go ahead. Um, I used to start out collecting all sorts of art, photography, painting, sculpture, etc. But right from the beginning I knew that what I wanted was to share what I love with other people. So I, uh, even before I started collecting, I collaborated with the museum. So the work I would produce by would go to the museum as a loan and then as a promised gift so it would stay in the museum because I feel very strongly that art is made to be seen. I don't feel that art is made to be stored in somebody's basement and even the fact that it's hung in somebody's house, it's a little compromise I do myself because I have some art in my house but I feel that the more people that see it, the better it is. And um, this all started when I was in Paris in 1999. I did not uh, collect at the time. I was not involved in contemporary art. And I saw an exhibition announced that was called Remake of the Weekend by an artist called Pipi Lotiris. And I said, what a funny name. What a funny title. I'll go in and have a look at it. And I was absorbed in the universe of Pipi Lotiris. She's a Swiss video artist, one of the first really you know, she's been active since the early 1990s, and it's a work that's very sensual. You can sort of smell the grass, the, the, you feel her wet skin, uh, the, the colors, uh, the, you can smell everything. It, it's very, very sensuous. And I spent hours in that environment. Uh, it was projected onto a kitchen cabinet and in a living room and on lampshades, and it was really a pipiloti universe. Universe, and because she also makes her own music. So I spent two hours there and then I stepped out. It was a May day and it was very sunny and I, my eyes had to get used to the sun. But I knew one thing, that I wanted to be part of this world. And I wanted to share this world with other people. So then the question was, how do you do that? So it took a while to find a museum director who was interested in collaborating with me. This was as I said, in 1999, a time when in Holland uh, the museums got lots of subsidies 
from the government, they really weren't very keen on working with private people. In fact, they were always a little bit hesitant because they felt that a private person is a little bit suspect. You know, he might have some m other m um, motives to collaborate. And you know how these rich people are. They always try to get better out of whatever they do. So I was not received with open arms at the time. I must say, 10 years later, things changed because a lot of these subsidies dried up and then the museums had to find out other ways to finance. But the work was, um, the works that I, I chose, one of the first ones I chose, coincidentally, was in Art Basel, turned out to be a um, video by Pipi Lotirist. So my first work was video art, and then I branched out into all sorts of other things, and I'm <coughs> kind of a, um, a person with a tendency to expand on and on, because I'm, I, I, I'm so interested by so many different things. So uh, apart from art, uh, I was also interested in cutting edge fashion. And I started all sorts of projects around that. And I even uh, had scholarships for uh, Spanish writing artists. And I would go on and on and on. And then a point came uh, through an exhibition of one of the uh, fashion projects that, that we produced where a Chinese uh, curator asked me if he could make an exhibition of the videos from my collection. And I'd never thought about that. That was my private collection. Never thought about that. And he did, and it turned out beautifully. It was a very small, very f refined museum, and all the videos had room to breathe. It was sort of, for me, like I saw them for the first time. And then I said, this was in 2015, I said, Yes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue with video art because this is where my heart lies. I think also because I'm a writer, I like the narrative part of video art, which is much more difficult to find in other media. And there's a very, um, I'm Dutch, there's a very uh, a practical side to it. It's of course no transportation costs, no, no insurance costs, because when you move other pieces of art around that can be quite expensive. So we save all that money and use it to produce work rather than pay for transportation and, and insurance. That's what I've been doing since 2016. And it's been working out wonderfully because I created a niche. I found a niche for myself with, with, with this video art. And there's not that much support for video art, particularly not in, uh, in, in countries where there's not much of an, an art infrastructure. Again, sorry for expanding on that, but the bottom line is really that at the age of, well, let's say over 60, I realized that one of the most important things in life is to focus. So it took me a long time to find that out. You know, focus really means saying no to many, many other things and going for the one thing that you find important. Well, thank you for that executive summary. Okay, uh, I, I, I want to ask you, Timothy, um, so you mentioned the, the tragedy of colonialism, right? That's a word that's come up. Um, Han has just talked about poetry. And what, what attracts him as a collector? There is the art market, there's art infrastructure, there's a gallery system. You, as a practicing artist, how do you fit all those things in? Your intellectual uh, passions, uh, your, you know, your aesthetic passions, those of others that uh, will buy your work or commission so that you can continue your work. How do you negotiate all that? Well, it's a question that is very challenging to answer. It's not an easy question. But again, like, like what Han just said, focus. So for me, I try to focus on the question that I make and then try to really work on that question and also really to develop uh, the way I work. At the beginning, I, I didn't really, I never think about the art, uh, about the market. For me, yeah, I mean, during all of this process, the market I considered as a bonus, as a bonus. I don't want to uh, put too much weight on selling uh, my artworks because I don't want to be I mean, I don't, I have to put it in the correct words here. I don't want to be 
uh, distracted, like making works so that I can sell, I mean, in that particular context. Because for me, since I started from the question, I really want to work on the question and how to really create a powerful work and then a strong work, a strong narratives, and then create a such experience. But I believe if I make something uh, with maybe like 100% and focus on it, I can get bonus. And then the market is the bonus of it. The bonus of being consistent, the bonus of being focused, and then, yeah, I mean, yeah, we never predict the future, but then for me, just keep making works and then keep uh, diving and then uh, developing and I'll keep studying and then focusing. That's what I've been doing for the 10 years on, on this particular question. And is that important for you when you look at who you give a commission to or the foundation? Is, it, is there something about the um, consistency in practice, about the artists and their commitments that makes them stand out, or is it just the artwork? Well, see, this time I can answer quite, pretty quickly. You can be relieved about that. But uh, I, don't, I don't make those decisions at all. It's the art institutions. I've, I've liberated myself from all these considerations. It's the art institutions, and I'm sure that the art institutions take all sorts of things into consideration, but never the market value. They will always take into consideration if this is a work they really want to show in the art institution. In a sense, you know, in art institutions like Ilham Gallery, if you show something, you sort of identify with it as an art institution, right? And I think that's the most important thing. Is this something that goes with who we are? So again, I've, I've outsourced all of that. Actually, Rahel, if you're in the room, Rahel was part of the selection process. So if there are any questions that you want to ask about that process, because it was really an involved one, I gather, from the little discussion I had with Rahel earlier. But uh, it's time, if you like, we could already start opening up. It's uh, 10 to 5 now. Uh, if there are questions uh, in any direction that you'd like it to go, please put up your hand and a, and a mic will come to you. Yes, please. Just uh, for the sake of the documentation, just identify yourself. A name would be good enough. Thank you. I'm Dime. I have a question for Timotheus. So you were mentioning questions in creating your work. I was wondering what are the questions that you ask yourself in the past 10 years or more? Um, who do you look for when you're asking those questions? Where, who do you look towards when, you ask, when you're looking for answers? And where do you look for those answers? And what happens within yourself as an artist when you can't find them yet? Good yeah, good question. And thanks for putting this question in this room. Uh, for me, this question always uh, came about uh, from my experience and then it's always reflecting back to me as, as a part of the society, I believe, as a part of the generation. And then the way I feel, and then the way the whole this, uh, the whole this uh, social structure, the, and also the, the stimulation that came to me, uh, I believe that it's also connecting to, to the larger uh, uh, society. And me, as a part of this, for me, it's always coming back to me like, I always, how the way I read the history? How I, the way I read the history, how the way I perceive the history? And then also start from me and then I look to, the, to my family and then how this, this kind of a question operates within my family. And then it just getting much broader and then how it operates within my neighborhood, my society. But at least I try to be honest with myself. I put myself as a subject and then, yeah, try to find the connection to yeah, the bigger uh, dots outside of me and also to find then the power relation that construct all of this consciousness that then I accept this as a truth back then. Because, yeah, I mean, everyone has their own experience, has their own uh, different uh, baggage, their own context. So by for me, by being honest, uh, 
with uh, this question, uh, this reflection, and then try to reflect it back uh, to the what surrounds me. That's how I uh, develop, and then I, yeah, I try to transform this question into the artwork. If I can extend that question, mm -hmm. could you explain where that methodology comes from? Is it something you were trained to do it from ah, your yeah, religious yeah, yeah. or social background? Why that methodology? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It's also uh, important to 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 uh, stitch this with this my uh, educational background because I think I would. That's why because I was trained uh, as an ethnographer. So I studied in my uh, bachelor uh, in uh, communication science, social, political, social and political studies, and then I continued uh, studying uh, for cultural studies for my masters. And then here, uh, during my PhD, I'm doing a cultural analysis, where in my uh, uh, bachelor and master and now in the PhD, it's all connected with this ethnographical uh, methodology, which I believe it's strongly mirrored in the way I work, in, in the way I perceive and the way I narrate, which in ethnography itself, we have to acknowledge also our subjectivity. I mean, when, when we are doing the research, we are bringing some impacts also to, to the people that we are uh, dealing, dealing with uh, during the research. It's not about the, the how to say, like, the positivistic uh, objectivity. I mean, we have our own role uh, and also our intervention in, in the field that we are researching, in the subject that we are uh, dealing with, uh, in the pe uh, to the people that we are having discussion and conversation. And we have to admit also our baggage, where, where we came from and then what did we study, and uh, our experience, uh, our background. So by admitting this reflexivity and our subjectivity and also the impact that we are bringing also to the uh, research field and then also to the subjects that we are dealing with. So uh, this uh, logic also uh, have an uh, important uh, influence in the way i building my work. Are there more questions? Pauline? I have a question for uh, Timotheus. I'm Pauline and I'm the creative director of Pusaka. We work with traditional um, performing arts communities all around Malaysia. Um, so I'm very interested in the reason you chose the Jatilan as a subject for your video work and I would like you to maybe tell us a bit more about um, how you perceive the Jatilan. There is a kind of um, there is a practice of Jatilan and Kudakepang here as well, which we work with very closely. Um, and from, I think it's quite different the way it's practiced here um, than it is still in Java. In, in Malaysia now, there's not really an element of trance in the Jatilan, but in the Kudakepang there is. Mm -hmm. um, and in Malaysia, the, the Kudakepang tradition has been, it's, there is a fatwa on it. It's, there's been a fatwa on it for more than 10 years. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask is, if, is there a similar reaction to Jatilan in, uh, and also Kudalumping in Java. I know there are some Islamist forces that are making some kind of um, issues about these traditions. And does your work also respond to that um, yeah. new video? Thank you for the question. What makes Jatilan interesting for me is because it is really bottom up. I mean, it is coming from the grassroots, it is coming from the people. Uh, the peop uh, I mean, how the people, uh, they respond to their reality, uh, the way they live. So by having this uh, particular rituals bottom up from the grassroots, so many versions of Jatilan uh, exist in, in Indonesia, in Java, and so many approaches. So there, there is no, no strict formulation of Jatilan, I would say. And then what also fascinates me is the, what Jatilan offers is the, the idea of in-between, the idea of trans, trans as a, as a blind spot, as a, as a gray area where people can be, people can become anything. They, where the disorder, where the chaos has the place, 
to be expressed, where this unconscious and repressed memory and trauma has its uh, place to be channeled. And then, yeah, in the state of trance, in the state of uh, being possessed, that also uh, signifies the idea and the, the, the concept of time that actually uh, internalize in the people's uh, way in perceiving the environment. So for me, there are so many things uh, embedded and integrated in the Jatilan itself. So this multi-layered and this so many doors to get into the Jatilan offers the metaphors to see bigger things beyond the Jatilan itself, to see also about the trauma and also about how the people react to the repressed experience and the history and also how to channel what's so-called chaos and then also uh, what's so-called uh, how it dealt with the idea of order then because in Jatilan first we have order we have this uh, pattern and then suddenly slightly little by little it's just getting much more uncontrollable and then and then yeah completely it can become total chaos so when we have this performance, we cannot set the exact start time and end time. You have to go with the flow. We have to, to feel the performance. We have to, to be there and then, yeah, to, to let it end itself. So, I mean, in this kind of experience and encounter with this concept of, of time and the frequency, the energy, it offers uh, many things and it, it gives a lens to see more beyond the Jatilan itself. Yeah. Han, if I can, I want to draw you in, but not as somebody from the foundation of founded it and this, this infrastructure that you created, but somebody who loves art. Um, the translation of these, in some ways, you know, uh, beautifully articulated intellectual uh, frameworks to understand the world and you just liminal spaces and all those things, right? It comes from our study of anthropology. Um, where does it become art for you? What is that poetic that you you've, you know, reportedly want in art? If you could address that question, because Timotheus is translating, I guess, his his ideas into art, into an aesthetic experience. Talk it, talk to us about your sense of that. Yeah, I think this is, this is a very good question. Um, and that's something we have to deal with, particularly with video art, because it's, it's in a sense, a new medium for many th people. But it's also, video is something people are so used to. You know, you, you shoot your videos with your own telephone. Uh, you have documentary videos. You have newsreels. You have all sorts of videos. So there's, there's often confusion with the public of what is video art. And there's sometimes confusion with artists as well. You know, where, where does it stop being a documentary and where does it become uh, video art? This is really your question. I think it becomes art when, it's, when the artist is able to take a certain distance and puts the work that the artist has been recording in a different context. And look at it differently. And um, you're very right, I'm always looking for this poetic element. And with many artists, it works very well. You know, also with you, because you're integrating the, the dancing and you're integrating, um, the, in a way, it's art about art going on as well. Um, so I, I mentioned that I'm drawn to a narrative but it doesn't always have to be a linear narrative. Like in your videos, it's not a linear narrative, but there is definitely a story that's being told. So perhaps if I can say that it's a somehow poetic way uh, of telling a story, showing something without being all too explicit about what you're showing. And I, I know that I'm, I'm, uh, this is all very tentative and very vague, perhaps, but that's exactly, I think, the idea of, of, of visual art, because otherwise 
you could write about it, which is what I do, right? But the whole thing about visual art is that it goes a step beyond. It is something that can often not be captured in words, but it is something that you feel when you look at it. Um, so perhaps the bottom line is it's art when I feel that it's art. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say something to that question about how do you take those ideas and make it art? Like everything, I mean, in the process of making it's always started also about the feeling. How it vibrates you. How, how, it, how your body reacts to it and then how it changes, how it stimulates you. So, yeah, it's very personal in that sense, how it becomes artistic and poetic. Yeah. Question. Uh, you, can, you can ask that question again. Did, did you put up your hand? Is there anybody else who wants to ask a question? No? Please go ahead. I'll continue to hug the mic. Uh, just to carry on from what Hans was saying about being vague uh, versus what is measurable. I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about the gatekeeping that happens because what you said earlier on was very unique in a sense that you really like you relinquish the power to choose what is art or what or like how other curators say what is worthy of being put in a museum and if you can elaborate on that gatekeeping process and another one for Timotheus about revisiting the narratives about looking into the decolonization and post-colonial narratives, how do you look at them without going into a state of analysis paralysis where you can't unsee the existing status quo anymore without thinking, oh, it gets worse and worse every time I dig up another layer? Yeah. Thank you. Why don't you start? Okay. Can you try to repeat your question. I'm, I'm still trying to digest it, sorry. Uh, yeah. So when you revisit the, the existing status quo, the existing narratives, and you find issues with it, how do you not fall into analysis paralysis where you feel like helpless, like you can't do anything anymore? Because the more you research, the more angrier yeah. you might get. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, the way, I mean, the more we know, the more we don't know. Ironically, yeah. So, ironically, the way I get into it, the more I get much more pessimistic in that sense. But then what can I do as an artist? And then what can I do as a human being? So, with all I have, with all I can do as an artist, I try to at least make the simple things that I can still believe this is, can make a little change. Let's say, working with people, collaborating with people, and then making the, like, a fair consent, and then like a fair engagement, and then also a good acknowledgement uh, with the people that I collaborate. So like all of the simple steps, all of the simple details that I believe this will make change, at least if it's for me, then with the people that I work with, we share a good value. So, so sometimes it's not that grande in the end, yeah. I very much agree with the idea that the more you know, the more you don't know, you know that you don't know, which is a lot more than a lot of people who feel that they know a lot. But it doesn't mean that you continue to ask questions all the time, right? And then your question about my being the gatekeeper. Um, I'm, I'm talking about this as if this were a strategy that I started uh, many years ago, but that's not at all the case. It was something that happened organically. You know, in the very beginning, I also had a share in, in deciding who the artist was going to be. And um, because I, I was starting, and so I would copy what I knew, like we all do. And then finally, I found my own way. And my way is to let go. I start something, 
I, I have an initiative, I make sure that it's on the rail, and then I give it a push, and then I let others take over. It gives me a feeling of freedom, really. Uh, any other questions? Any, anybody want to sort of explore the Chitu? Hi, I just have a question for Timotheus. Um, so I understand you actually live in Amsterdam, you work and live in Amsterdam right now. And I wonder, um, what is the local reception like and how is it like for you um, to be working on a subject such as this? You know, it's, you're basically investigating um, the horrors of, of colonization in the country where that once colonized you. So I'm just curious, like, how, how's that like for you? And also for the people that you work with and, yeah. and the reception towards your work. Yeah. Thank you, Chitu, for the question. Yeah. It's, it's very multi-layered, I would say. So there are so many versions of perception. It depends on whom I bumped in with. So, because like there are so many uh, colonial memories in the Netherlands. So many pers like there are people from Maluku. There are pe uh, Indo people also, and also like the third generation of the former uh, sugar cane plantation owner, let's say, and there are from a uh, like third generation of colonial officer. But also there are some 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 people who choose, I mean, who had no choice but to go to the Netherlands because of the, the, the social pressure and also the, the violence that, that happened uh, during the revolution, let's say. So, so many layers to get into this, uh, uh, this complex landscapes. But, so, there is no generalization to answer this 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 experience but but uh the problem i mean it's not only the problem of of uh me being in the netherlands also but i think it's not only there but it's also like in in many uh former colonized country also like the the problem of forgetting like the amnesia and also the ignorance that you, you, you brought forward also. And yeah, the piles of this uh, ignorance and forgetting, for me, I can feel it. Not only in the Netherlands, but also when I come back to Yogyakarta, to Indonesia. And then sometimes it's just replaced by the idea of nostalgia. But let's say, who's nostalgia? I mean, when I'm in Jogja, I... Uh, I had a meeting in the cafe, let's say, a cafe with the colonial uh, uh, interior, uh, very uh, beautiful, uh, and then, but actually that was the experience that we, we had never experienced. That's very elitistic. I mean, who's nostalgia uh, with all of this, uh, the beauty and this elitistic, uh, the, the, the priyayi, let's say. So, uh, in another hand, also it happened in the Netherlands like the idea of beautiful Indies, the paradise. And yeah, so it's, it's very complex to answer this question. It's, and it really depends on in whom uh, we are talking with and what kind of memory that they, uh, that pass through the generation, through their family also. And then, yeah, for me, this fact, this situation then, it's, it's also stimulate me to work with, with these people and also to collaborate with these people and also yeah, to, to find a way to create like the more multi-layered experience also because it's not uh, singular in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this question of colonialism is very interesting. We just recently learned uh, that Joseph Conrad, while Polish uh, and sensitive to the colonial experience, writing about, in like, so for instance, Heart of Darkness, was himself born in the Ukrainian part of uh, and, and experience colonialism that was internal to, to Europe. 
And so the colonial experience is not merely a European Asian or European third world um, you know, frame. So, uh, but it's, it's an interesting one because um, uh, in Malaysia, we read our colonial history in particular ways. Indonesia, clearly, you're reading it in particular ways too. Um, want to ask if there are any more questions? Um, to do with the art. I know a lot of you haven't seen it because uh, you've just come and the work is quite demanding in terms of, um, uh, you know, you have to sit there for. What is the length of the videos that downstairs? The video, they are in a two channel and every video is that for 22 minutes. So in total it's 44 minutes. Which is, yeah. which is quite um, um, a commitment, I think, for some. Uh, though uh, I think people can sit through Oppenheimer for three hours. They can watch. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can, do you have sense around? I don't know. Okay, then the other questions is, there, I see artists in the room, people who work in video, people who also work uh, with some of these issues around historical narratives that Ford was here. Um, do you want, have a question? Uh, okay, okay, Dane, over there, filmmaker. For those who don't know you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask you, uh, both of you, um, I'm trying to phrase it. Um, okay, there's, I can only do this by example. There's a scene, let's say, in, I can't remember where it was, New York, New York, or Once Upon a Time in America, and so the camera moves towards Robert De Niro. I think he's either just, just put the phone down, or, yeah, he's just put the phone down. And what it, and the camera lingered on him longer than it needed to, which then forced me, or the audience perhaps, to think, why did they do that? And then you realize maybe he's thinking or showing that's how long it took for that character or for a person to think. Um, just that one shot, but there are other sequences in many films, for example, where you can take it out of the film and rip it off. Whether it's in the film or you can rip it off, that is still, in a way, a piece of video art. So then, taking that in mind, where do you go from there to documentaries that are two minutes, three minutes, ten minutes, to TikTok, to Instagram, and to everything in the proliferation of mediated images that we see today? Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are in the way that, aside, aside from the fact that I like what you said, it's very valid, the most valid thing is, with video art, it's a space or it's a place that you can show what can never be shown, say what cannot be said. But aside from that, do you think that there will be not much difference in the future, which is today and 10 years ago? Now, the question is to both of them, right? I'm not sure I understood it. is any more relevant than TikTok, Instagram, and everything else that's in the proliferation of images that we have today? I'm, I'm not sure that uh, qualifying something as being relevant or irrelevant is so important. I think the whole idea of video art is that it has to be shown in a specific situation, in a site. It, you wouldn't want to show snippets of your videos on TikTok because it's completely taken out of context. And I also think another element is exactly what you said, that it requires a commitment of the spectator to sit there for 44 minutes. And I think that's a very good thing, particularly now that our attention span generally doesn't go much longer than 50 seconds. And to um, make that effort to sit down and look at a work of art, it's almost like a meditation. You know, and, and 
That's very important. That's really what we need. These are my feelings about that. Before, you, before, just Dane, you know, we just had the tour, and one of the things that was quite striking about the tour was a kind of pedagogical commitment on the part of Tim Matthias to talk us through the work, right, by starting us in that first room, by saying what was on the wall and why that history was important versus what was on the opposite wall before we entered into the video chamber, though we didn't actually watch the video together. But there is, in a sense, I think you, you said that my work uh, is complex and it requires this sort of unpacking. Um, and so I, I just wanted to throw that in, but please. Yeah. I think to answer this question, I'm going to position myself as the audience. For me, as the audience of the moving images, it's a completely different experience when I see uh, the film in the cinema with all of this black box and in a very, very comfortable couch. And then also like in the context of exhibition as a video art and scrolling in my phone. That way of consuming, let's say, or even producing the thoughts of encountering that medium is completely different, completely different. So in that sense, the video art has its place, which can be differentiated than uh, things that we are scrolling in TikTok, which is completely, we had no choice on it because the algorithm they offer they thought what we are going to see, what we are interested with through the phones. But yeah, there is a commitment in encountering uh, the show, video art. We have to read the text, mm -hmm. we have to experience it. So yeah, I mean, this kind of uh, effort and also uh, this kind of uh, processing gives some, some layer of thoughts some layers of, of, of how this medium works also uh, for the audience. Uh, Dane, does yeah. that satisfy uh, you? Can I, can I ask one more thing? Uh, when you talk about Tic Tac and about uh, YouTubes and, and, and all these other things, it's really very important that 100,000 people have seen it or a million or whatever, because that it really shows its validity, its success or whatever. With video art, it's completely different. It doesn't make any difference how many people see it, but the fact that people make that effort to sit down for 44 minutes, that's important. If it's 100 people, that's okay. You don't want to reach 100,000 uh, people. You know? So it has its own integrity, as it were. There was also something of the artist showing his means, you know, the means by which he works. Uh, uh, but that's context. Every, every media, medium has a context. We understand that. Yeah, but it doesn't mean and it, it doesn't make it any less important. Right, so all I'm asking is I'm just, actually I guess I'm stirring. I'm just stirring Stir shit away, out. Stir away, Dane I just wanted to know That's... where and how you feel about it because in this age today, as you said rightly, people don't have the span or the attention span of two more than 30 seconds. We understand all that, but in terms of the materiality, in terms of regardless whether you watch it on a device, in the cinema, or anything else, the work itself, the materiality of the work, whether, and that's why I keep saying, yes, I understand and I agree with you that it's, it's a space for saying what you can't say, showing what you can't show, but ultimately, is there in the future, or even now, is there really a lot of difference in your mind, where we're heading in terms of whether it's video art, like TikTok, Instagram, do you know what I'm saying? Where, where, will it, where will it end? Yeah. Well, I think that's the shared question. That's an open-end question. It's like the rapid and radical growth of the machine learning algorithm, the, the AI. We haven't have the answer yet. And once we think we have the answer, it just keeps running forward. So, yeah. There's also this thing, Dane, I think um, it's a long conversation about the emancipatory potential of art, right? And it's an old Marxist conundrum, how do, you know, uh, for at least the 20th century. So can art, is art differentiated from the TikToks because it seeks 
to change the way you think about the world. I think that is something true of artists and your work. You want people to think differently about colonial history and the contemporary uh, reverberations of that versus what might be produced on a TikTok in terms of what the creators behind TikTok might be doing. It can still be produced on TikTok. It can still be can produced it? on TikTok. It can still, yes, Good question, not? can it? Yes. Uh, I think Nandita... You assume that it cannot because it's, what, 30 seconds? No, I don't think it's the duration. Oh, because, because the location, of the site of the viewing, and the site where it is viewed, right, changes the nature of the actual subject? Not necessarily. Uh, does anybody want to join this conversation? Uh, Nandita, did you want to follow on on that or did you have a different question? Okay. Uh, we'll take up this up later. We'll, we'll stand by the disclaimer, very interesting disclaimer he has in the second room uh, that I think points to an answer for you. But Nandita, let's get your question first then. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, hello. I'm Nandita. I work in film with Dane. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> That's a very modest way of yeah. describing your relationship, but yeah. okay. Yeah. But um, so my first question is for Timoteus because. Um, uh, I haven't seen the work yet, but earlier when we were downstairs, you mentioned that you incorporated AI in making some of it, right? So I think I'm struggling with AI and how we work with it. Uh, you know, like I have, uh, when we work with scripts, should we be bringing AI in? But when we work with VFX, I feel like, yes, let's embrace the AI. It helps us do our work. So in your case, I'm also seeing a kind of a parallel with the AI and your the Jatilan itself, where you say the Jatilan uh, is an in-between, like a liminal space, and AI actually can be looked at that way. So I was wondering uh, why you chose to work with AI and um, how, how, in what way you did. So that's one question. The other one is this conversation we're having about uh, video art itself and who gets to see it and, and where, because I really, really love video art, and like Hans from the, the first the gallery I went to and I saw, it kind of blew, blew my mind away. And I'm very lucky with Dane that sometimes we get to work on video art and that's really when I'm happiest, you know? Uh, I hate doing stuff for TV or for a brand or something. But the problem with video art is it's usually tied to it being commissioned by somebody or having a gallery uh, and it's a lot with where you're going to show it, how is it going to be shown. Um, so in your case, with this work, you're very lucky that it's going to be shown now at four or five uh, different uh, spaces in different countries. But I was just curious, what are the plans or are there any for showing it back in Indonesia? Because what you're doing is very important for an Indonesian and a younger Indonesian audience as well. So I think it does matter because it's very thought provoking and you want, convers you want to instigate conversation. So it does matter that more than a hundred people see yeah. it. It's not about the popularity on Instagram or, or TikTok for sure, but uh, how can we make it more accessible? Um, yeah, and also for Han as somebody who supports uh, video art, how can we make more people aware that there's such a thing called video art and maybe there'll be more people trying to make more video art in the future as well and saying more things through it. Side note, Dane's made some beautiful video art. At least it's in one piece. Yeah, true, true. I want to start with the second question first. Yeah. Uh, with the community that I work with, I, like at the end of this year, I plan to, to show uh, this uh, particular uh, works in the cinema and I will invite those who were involved in the production and then to see the whole production that we did, that we have done together in the big screen. That for us, that will be our experience to see the whole, uh, the whole production after it has been done and it has been circulated. And then, I mean, to, to have this kind of screening also together uh, with my collaborators, it's, it's kind of a a meaningful thing, a valuable thing that can be done uh, in a post uh, post screening after this being uh, circulated, and also the, another strategy to to have this uh, this videos being screened also in another uh, place and institution is to to 
to have them in the film festival because the video can be stood as the video art with all of these uh, elements and and like here in in Ilham at Ilham you can see not only the two video art but also the thoughts that is being implemented on the other four channels video and then the, these images the reproduction of governor general painting in order to create the holistic experience of this idea that I try to to question through the Phantom trilogy, but then the video art itself, the moving image itself, can be uh, experienced in another way as cinema in the big screen, where people sit and then enjoy it in a different way, in the black box and then in the state of dreaming uh, through all of those cinematic apparatus and then. There must be a different experience than to enjoy it, and so it's not gonna stop in the institutions of video art, but also like the the spirit of this uh, this uh, circulation that Han also said to share, to share, uh, and then also to yeah to to circulate this, to share this, and and to make it uh, visible, and then connected to the second question. Also, uh, with this uh, uh, AI that I incorporated in the world and, and how it's uh, being integrated or not integrated, uh, connected also with the Jatilan as the metaphor, because like collectively we are struggling with it. Not only you, but I also have my struggle with AI and also, but this is the world that we are facing now. So I'm sharing this question together through this exhibition and then through these methods of, of blurring the idea of what is the fact, what is the truth, what is the fiction, and then the future of archive. But the archive itself, is it neutral, the AI? Is the AI neutral or is it re uh, reproducing the logic or the gaze that had been reproduced through the colonial ethnography? So all of these questions that we are dealing now, it's, it's an open-ended question. And yeah, I'm, I'm inviting you to get into this question together. I, I, I think uh, Timoteus answered uh, your last question of how do we get more people to appreciate video art really, right? And uh, as, you, as he said, we're already showing in, in different art venues, but of course there the problem is that it's not everybody who goes to an art venue, right? You or preach to those who are already converted in that sense. So I think that um, Timoteo is bringing his video to the people that he worked with uh, is a very f good first step and I actually know of another artist, Marta Atienza, I don't know if you know her from the Philippines, who had a similar program where she worked with fishermen there and she showed the work in their environment and people were really very um, surprised and delighted to see themselves on the screen, you know. So uh, taking the work out of the white box, as it were, and putting it in, in, in a different context might be helpful. Okay, we're coming to the end of the, the session. So if there are any last very quick questions, we could take it. Otherwise, I'm just going to ask uh, Han to maybe say a little bit about the foundation before we go, and then I'm going to invite Rahel to also say some, make some closing remarks. Is she there? Is she hiding away? There she is. Okay. Is there any last uh, comments, questions? Something that we can all take home with us and ru ruminate over? No? Okay. So, um, would you want to say something about the foundation since it's instrumental uh, to this exhibition, this collaboration? Yeah, I, I, well, I talked a little bit about the way we work. We have different grants and we work with different art institutions. But really, what I feel so happy about is that we are all here because of that, you know, because um, I have been able to set something into motion and have been able to share it with other people who felt compelled to participate, the art institutions and then in the end the artist. Um, and this is, this is so wonderful, you know, I, I got to know you because of that, I got to know Timoteus, got to know Rahel, I've gotten to know so many people here in Malaysia that I would never have known. Uh, and, and, and the people here are very warm, it's really nice to be here. And, um, and it's all thanks to art. So, 
if anybody has any questions about the value of art, you know, I can answer those. Thank you very much. Uh, so a round of applause for our guests. And I'd like to invite uh, Rahel. Again, she was a judge in this process, so you know, if you're aspiring artist, you might want to corner her. I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's gonna hate me for this. <laughs> She's not gonna buy me my dinner. Okay. Um, well, before I end by thanking everyone, uh, I do wanna say, uh, just being part of this collaboration has been so important for Ilham. Um, I think it's been actually quite wonderful every year to be able to just see these and learn more about artists from the region. You know, for me personally, um, really just finding out about video artists from the region and having the opportunity to look at their work um, has, has really been important. Um, and it's been such a privilege for us to have your work, uh, Timotheus, uh, here at Ilham. <laughs> and, and to work with you, Han, and we look forward to uh, many more years uh, working together. And uh, thank you uh, to Han Timotheus, thank you so much, Sharad, for moderating the session. Um, I, think, uh, I think they will be around a little while, so if you want to corner them and ask them more questions. Uh, but the gallery will be open till 7, uh, both for this uh, exhibition and also on level 3. So do go down and uh, view the videos. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.